Okay, great. Okay, so, um, right. So we have a smaller audience today. Hopefully people trickle in. I think it's just this time of year, right? Everyone's really busy trying to navigate timetables and um, work and workload or whatnot. But I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, myself and I imagine Mervyn are very much interested in the content um, of, that, of, of the research that you're doing, Francisco. So it'll be a great discussion, um, no doubt. So <clears throat> for the recording and for everyone who is in the virtual audience, I just want to give a warm welcome and thank you for being a part of um, this seminar series. Um, and welcome to our next New Voices seminar. So my name is Amanda Chisholm and I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Security Studies and organizer and chair of this series. So for those of you who don't know, New Voices in Global Security is a virtual path platform. It's in its second year running, uh, and it's designed to showcase and amplify the diverse and vibrant expertise of our PhD and ECRs across the school. So this year, we have formed a collaboration with the journal Critical Military Studies, where the editor-in-chief, um, Victoria Basham, will be working closely with our presenters in developing um, blog posts based on their presentations. So please watch that space for the publication of these, um, or watch this space for the publication of these posts as they materialize. Today I'm very pleased to welcome Francisco Lobo and Francisco is a doctoral researcher at the Department of War Studies here at King's College. His thesis focuses on the professional military ethics, human rights and human dignity. Uh, he holds a law degree from the University of Chile. He also holds an LLM in the um, International Legal Studies from New York University and that's sponsored by the Fulbright Commission, and a Master's of Law specializing in international law from the University of Chile. He is a lecturer in international law, human rights law, international criminal law, and legal theory. And he has worked um, uh, as a, a New York University Fellow in International Law and Human Rights as the International Law Commission uh, of the United Nations in 2018, where he assisted the special report on preem sorry, preemptory norms of um, general international law uh, in New York and Geneva. So this is quite an incredible um, background you have, Francisco. So his research interests include international law, human rights, the law of armed conflict and just war tradition and international criminal law, as well as multidisciplinary approaches uh, to the phenomenon of violence from the perspective of history, philosophy and ethics. The title of Francisco's talk today is the Capture or Kill Debate Revisited, putting the human back into human enhancement of soldiers. His presentation is based upon an article that is forthcoming, uh, which revisits the cutting edge capture or kill debate, offering a fresh outlook uh, that reconstrues the notion of human enhancement of soldiers from a normative standpoint. Francisco is joined uh, today by Professor Mervyn Frost, who will act as his discussant. Uh, Mervyn is a professor in international relations here in war studies and a world-renowned scholar on ethics and international relations. Uh, he was educated at the University of Stellenbosch and subsequently a Rhodes Scholar read politics at Oxford. Uh, Mervyn held lectureships at the University of Cape Town and at Rhodes University before being appointed to the Chair of Politics and Head of Department at the University of Natal in Durban. In 1996, he took up the position of Professor of International Relations at the University of Kent in Canterbury, uh, and uh, he is past president of the South African Political Studies Association and was editor of its journal. Mervyn has held international executive roles on international research bodies, including International Studies Association, and he also serves on numerous editorial boards. Um, from June to August 2019, Mervyn was the first distinguished professorial visiting fellow at the University of New South Wales in um, Canberra, Australia. And beyond his role in war studies, uh, Mervyn is currently a professor our professorial research associate at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. His areas of interest are ethics and international relations, international political theory, ethical issues surrounding private military and security companies. A huge welcome to you both. 
Um, and again, to you, the audience, for coming and listening to what's going to be a no doubt a gripping discussion. So Francisco has agreed to talk for about 15 or 20 minutes, at which time Mervyn will offer some reflections and commentary before we open the floor up to you, the audience, for any questions and feedback. As usual, you can either ask these questions by raising your hand to ask them live or put them in the chat box and I can read them out loud. But without further ado, Francisco, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for that introduction. Thank you, Mervyn, for being here, for reading the article, and uh, to everyone for uh, uh, being here today uh, for this discussion, um, which will hopefully not be just a legal discussion, that's, that's not the, the aim, but uh, a broader uh, discussion beyond the, the legal issues. That's my, my aim here today. So let me just share my screen. Um, I think if I, if I share desktop, then I can access everything. Uh, so hopefully you can see that, right? Uh, and you can still hear me okay? Uh, excellent. So I'll just uh, minimize the windows here. Uh, maybe there, okay. Um, Okay, so uh, yeah, uh, a slight change uh, in the in the title of the presentation is not called uh, the capture or kill debate anymore because that's the the title of the article. But um, uh, yeah, I decided to focus more on military honor and human dignity, which is the title of my PhD research here at King's, and um, has to do more with uh, the ethical side of things and not uh, so much the legal side. Uh, even though the article I will be presenting today is uh, like 90% legal legal stuff. But um, I, I will try to briefly recap the, the legal discussion, the legal debate. Um, I know whenever uh, lawyers and academics say they're gonna be brief, they're lying. They're, they're probably not gonna be brief, but I'll do my best uh, to, to actually be brief, uh, recapping the the debate. So um, some preliminary considerations. Um, first, uh, well, as I said, as Amanda said, I'm doing the PhD in war studies here. It's not a PhD in law. Uh, I wasn't interested in, in just studying the legal aspect of armed conflict. I, I wanted to move beyond that. I still use the law quite a lot, quite often as a point of departure, as a normative framework. Um, and I, I go back to the law uh, constantly. My supervisor, Dr. Maria Varaki, she's also a lawyer, so that's very helpful. But uh, it goes beyond legal aspects, uh, what I'm doing here. And what I'm looking at uh, with my research is ways uh, in which we could, we, we could instill respect for human rights and human dignity in the military during their training and during their education uh, experiences. Um, so that's, that's uh, what I'm doing here at King's. Um, but I wanted to, to uh, say a couple of things about language and terminology. Um, in, in the legal field, we tend to use uh, lots of expressions um, uh, very freely and very um, clinically, very, uh, it sounds clinical and forensic when we do it, like uh, the law of armed conflict or targeted killings or um, combatants, non-combatants, neutralize and all of that. But we are actually talking about uh, killing people or not killing people. We're talking about people's lives. We're talking about destroying people's properties. Uh, separating families, uh, bombing countries. So um, uh, there should be trigger warnings uh, or we should uh, find more trigger warnings in, in legal scholarship, uh, in all scholarship uh, that, that deals with uh, armed conflict. And we don't find those often enough. So uh, yeah, I will be talking about the capture or kill debate. That's the name that it has in the literature, in the legal literature. But I am well aware that this is, this is not a small uh, this is not a trivial matter. It's it's literally a matter of life and death. So I'm very aware of that. And yeah, lawyers tend to forget that with all their acronyms and their uh, um, technicism. Uh, and the second the second uh, consideration in terms of language is well, um, there's also another uh, flaw that you can find in in legal scholarship that it's it's a lack of passionate discourse. Um, for this, I'm relying on, on Nasmo Dirsadeh. She's a, a, a professor at Harvard Law School. 
Uh, she has been defending for a couple of years the need to write more passionately about the law of armed conflict or humanitarian law. That doesn't mean you have to be emotional about it, but uh, just not treat it as something, again, clinical, uh, uh, scientific, but actually, if you're going to write about war, about armed conflict, about uh, destroying people's lives, you have to do it uh, with with passion, with conviction, you have to engage with uh, arguments about just war, uh, arguments about what's right and what's wrong, not merely the, the legal stuff. Uh, and she, she uh, wants to rescue that tradition that the legal scholarship had uh, in the 60s and 70s, writing about the Vietnam War, and that uh, during the war on terror uh, was lost. So she wants to revive that tradition, and I'm pretty much in favor of doing that. So. Um, that's, that's all about language and terminology. But yeah, let's move on to the debate, to the capture kill debate um, in IHL. Let me minimize this. Uh, so IHL is International Humanitarian Law or the Law of Armed Conflict. Yeah, I'm already using acronyms. See, this is, this is a problem. Um, and yeah, the capture kill debate is a debate that's been going on in the literature for roughly 10, 12 years. Um, it's not actually something that they discuss in the military. I was, I was uh, informed about this by a, a colleague in, in, in US Army Special Forces. He once told me, look, we don't even call it that. I mean, this is not part of mission statement ever. They don't tell us like in the briefing room, you gotta capture or kill. No, that's not part of the professional lingo that they use. But lawyers uh, and, and legal scholars have been using this language for over a decade now to refer to uh, um, some issues in IHL. So that's, that's why I'm using it as well. Um, and yeah, it starts with the principle of distinction in uh, international humanitarian law. According to this principle, uh, which is a cardinal principle in IHL, you only, uh, al you're only allowed to target combatants or military targets, and you're not allowed or it is prohibited to target non-combatants, non-military targets. That's, that's the, the, the essence of, of the principle of distinction. Uh, but you, you can exceptionally target non-combatants if they are directly participating in hostilities uh, or DPH, another acronym. DPH means direct participation in hostilities. And um, uh, in 2009, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, uh, came up with an interpretive guideline to actually well, explain what, what does DPH mean uh, and, and how, how could governments and the military uh, maybe um, apply this category or, or avoid misapplying the category of uh, DPH and uh, thus sticking to the principle of distinction, which is uh, the most important thing in the end. So uh, the ICRC came up with restraints on the use of force in direct attacks uh, in 2009 in the, in the guidelines, and they um, revived what was known as the Pictet Continuum because that's the, uh, uh, the name of the scholar and, and practitioner who came up with it um, in the 70s. But the Pictet Continuum basically states this. If we can put a soldier out of action by capturing him, we should not wound him. If we can obtain the same result by wounding him, we must not kill him. If there are two means to achieve the same military advantage, we must choose the one which causes the lesser evil. So uh, it's, it's an escalatory rationale. Uh, first capture, if not possible, wound, if not possible, then kill as a last resort. And that's the Pictet Continuum. And the ICRC reintroduced it in 2009, but not uh, without con controversy. And actually a lot of experts, IHL experts who were at the conference in 2009, nine, well, uh, and before, uh, were against this. And, and the, the ICRC took note of that. It's, it's actually in the guidelines. And yeah, that's how the debate started uh, in 2009. And in this debate, uh, we have two camps or two sides. We have the restrictionists and the expansionists. So the restrictionists are those who are in favor of applying the continuum, the epictet continuum, the escalatory rationale. Uh, so capturing over killing should be uh, favored. Um, and the expansion is, uh, this is all as a matter of, of, of uh, legal certainty, by the way. This is not an ethical debate. This is a legal debate. So restrictionists say the law says what they believe it says. 
and expansionists say, well, no, the law actually says uh, something different. But this is all within the realm of the law, by the way. So, uh, so restrictionists believe in the big tech continuum. Expansionists think that there is no evidence in state practice to support this continuum. It could be ethically uh, uh, attractive, sure, but it's not a matter of, of law. It's not lex lata. Uh, international humanitarian law, so uh, states have uh, freedom to capture or kill depending on what's more convenient uh, or military necessary uh, uh, in a given operation. That's basically uh, the gist of the debate. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to get much into it. Uh, uh, if you read the article, uh, you'll see that, uh, well, the, there's a lot of information there. So uh, if you're interested in the nitty gritty of the legal debate, uh, please read the article. Um, uh, but other than that, I'll, I'll just briefly recap the, the, the main points. So um, what, where does this come from, the debate? How, how could it be that lawyers don't agree about what IHL or this branch of the law actually says? Uh, well, that's usually the case with any branch of the law, a constitutional law, a private law, criminal law. You, always, you will always find uh, controversy among lawyers. So this is no different. Um, but in the case of IHL, I believe there is a misunderstanding uh, surrounding the purpose of IHL. The purpose of IHL, of the Law of Armed Conflict or International Humanitarian Law, is not to preserve life. Uh, we're beyond that when we we're talking about armed conflict. Um, the purpose of international human rights law, that is to preserve life, because we're not in a situation where, where life can be taken legally which we call war, right, or armed conflict. Once we are in a, in a situation of armed conflict, then the purpose is not to uh, uh, preserve life uh, because it's not part of the logic of warfare, but to alleviate human suffering. That's the whole point of IHL, that's the main point. Um, so we, we find a tension between restrictionists and expansionists, which I call a centrifugal tension because it's, it's in the end a tension between human rights law which is a different field, and international humanitarian law. And here the problem is that uh, uh, restrictionists, I'm sorry, are trying to import uh, human rights categories into, or law enforcement categories, the escalatory rationale and all that, into IHL, which is uh, a different field, uh, a different legal field. And, and on this, I'm with the expansionists. Um, but there's also a centripetal tension within IHL, within the law of armed conflict. Uh, matters are, are not clear. Uh, military necessity and humanity, which are uh, two other principles within IHL, uh, besides distinction, um, they, they are su supposedly, they work together or, or one is supposed to uh, temper or moderate the other, but we don't have clarity about what humanity means, uh, actually, and that, that is... Uh, one of the reasons I wrote the article because I wanted to contribute to the debate about not only capture or kill, but actually providing humanity with uh, its own content. Um, because the problem that we find within IHL is that all definitions of uh, humanity, the principle of humanity, is that, well, if something is not military necessary, then it goes against the principle of humanity. And something is military necessary, if it's required, needed, you will find different formulations. Again, uh, uh, you will find them in the article, but uh, in the end, it's all very cir circular because military necessity stands for what is needed, required, necessary to achieve a, a given uh, operational goal. And if it goes beyond that, or, or if it's not necessary, then it, it goes against the principle of humanity. But then humanity is just a military non-necessity or what is not military necessary. And that, that doesn't tell us much actually uh, about what humanity actually stands for uh, on its own. So that's the problem of uh, definitional circularity that, that I identify. Um, so there is a need in the end to confer an independent content to the principle of humanity. And that is why I, that is what I try to, to do uh, in the final sections of this article. So how can we do this? Um, 
Well, as I said, I'm interested in going beyond the law, beyond the legal debate. Uh, this is not something that uh, a lot of lawyers like to do. Uh, actually, most of them don't uh, like to go beyond the law and venture into ethics or philosophy. Uh, they're more comfortable within the confines of uh, legal reasoning and legal discourse. Um, but I think a good point of departure from the law uh, and beyond, beyond the law and moving into the field of ethics is the uh, renowned Martin's Clause. The Martin's Clause is a clause that was introduced in IHL instruments uh, over a hundred years ago, but it has been preserved in different formulations uh, uh, in different international treaties. And this is like um, the, the um, latest version of the Martin's Clause that we can find in additional protocol one to the Geneva Conventions. And it's, it says just this, in cases not covered by this protocol or by other international agreements, civilians and combatants remain under the protection and authority of the principles of international law derived from established custom, from the principles of humanity, so humanity here is, is, is key, and from the dictates of public conscience. Now, uh, I remember one of my IHL professors uh, once told us that whenever you resort to the Martin's Clause in a legal debate, that means you run out of arguments, out of legal arguments, and uh, it, it basically means you surrender. I mean, okay, okay, I don't have the legal answer, but remember the Martin's Clause, and so uh, that's why lawyers don't like this very much, because it means that they run out of legal arguments, and they have to venture into ethics or morality, and yeah, as I said, they're not very comfortable with doing that, but uh, I don't mind that, uh, and I think, actually, that uh, I agree with part of the literature that says that the Martin's Clause actually codifies the ancient code of chivalry and uh, the what in the Middle Ages was known as the Jus Armorum, or the Law of Arms, uh, which was the, the normative code that uh, the military professionals of the time, or proto-professionals, we're talking knights, soldiers, uh, etc., uh, applied uh, in, in, uh, in during armed conflict amongst themselves. Um, and the, the Martin's Clause is, is, again, a crystallization, a codification of that tradition. Um, also, regarding ethics, uh, the, the concept of honor is, is very important today in the military. It's still important. Uh, we, we might think that it's, it's, it's a quaint, obsolete, but actually within the military, it's part of the values, the stated values of uh, some militaries in the world, uh, including some US institutions as well. So uh, it's definitely something uh, very, very um, topical, uh, honor or military honor still. And within the debate, the capture or kill debate, actually some scholars like Gabriela Bloom acknowledge that uh, there are some honor theories that uh, espouse uh, the capturing over killing uh, uh, side of the debate. So um, these are the theories, uh, uh, for instance, advanced by um, um, uh, Thomas Nagel and Paul Kahn, uh, again, during the article, if you want to uh, check them out. But uh, in the end, military honor is seen as, a, as fighting fair with the, against the enemy and uh, as an enhanced sense of morality in the sense that the military think they are um, uh, called to uh, apply a higher set of standards of values, higher than civilians, higher than society. So um, uh, they, they, should, uh, they should abide by a, a more strict code of uh, ethics and uh, of, of law, of course. And I also tried to connect this in the article with human dignity, the concept of human dignity, which is mentioned in some IHL key instruments, but is not developed. Well, it's also mentioned uh, throughout international human rights law, but never defined. So that's also something I'm looking into uh, in my PhD. PhD research, uh, the concept of human dignity. And there are a number of theories, uh, uh, philosophical, legal, uh, about human dignity. I like the rank conception advanced by Jeremy Waldron, uh, a legal theorist uh, back at NYU. Uh, he believes that human dignity is actually legal status, uh, which comes with 
privileges both in times of peace and in times of war. So in times of peace, we have the right to life, the right to a fair trial, etc. But also in times of war, we're entitled to uh, being treated with respect, uh, uh, the right not to be humiliated, the right to uh, a fair trial, etc. Uh, all of which we can find uh, in common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions and Article 75 of the addition, Additional Protocol of the Conventions. And this is all Lex Lata, IHL. Lex Lata means uh, it, it is part of the law. It's not just a, a suggestion, it's not that uh, just a, a something that would be nice to have in the law. This is actually uh, part of the law. That's what we mean when we say Lex Lata. So um, I think this, this, this is a, a promising avenue to uh, actually endow the principle of humanity within IHL with a content of its own, uh, other than just mirroring or repeating what military necessity is or is not, rather. Um, so what is, the, what is the upshot of all of this? Um, well, in the end, my conclusion, after all those pages that some of you may have read or not in the article, is that the legal duty to respect human dignity, and it is a legal duty, uh, grounded again uh, on common Article 3, grounds at the same time a legal option, this is just an option, to capture that should be seriously considered in scenarios short of ruses of war, ruses of war are uh, uh, legal under IHL, where a fair fight is not possible. Um, again, as a result of this uh, rich tradition of military honor, chivalry, everything that we can find codified in the end in the, in the Martin's Clause. Um, and uh, maybe some, something of a, a policy recommendation at the end of the chapter, and that is something I'm actually looking uh, during my PhD research, uh, military training and education, is well, um, teaching all these values, uh, teaching the military, the, the, the people who will actually uh, make the call about whether to capture or kill another human being, teaching those folks, uh, well, uh, what military honor means, what human dignity means. Uh, so it, it is key that during military training and education, we do just that. Um, and we, we shouldn't underestimate um, the value of tradition uh, within the military. And I just wanted to close by illustrating this with, with a, a it, maybe it's something anecdotal, but uh, I found it very interesting uh, when I was uh, watching this on the news, like uh, this month or uh, this is very recent, but as you can see uh, in the US, um, they came up with these uh, brand new uniforms for their brand new Space Force. Uh, and yeah, people have, don't like them don't mu uh, that much, the, the uniforms. They think they're too sci-fi, that they're too, um, well, they're, they're just prototypes, but yeah, they, they didn't get a warm reception by the public. I, I think it's actually kind of the point that they look sci-fi if it's a Space Force, but uh, anyway. My point is this uniform is brand new. It doesn't have tradition because the Space Force doesn't have any tradition. I mean, it's, it's, it's new, uh, it's something for the future. But the military actually don't value uh, innovation um, and, and stuff for, uh, that uh, refers to the future as much as they do tradition, the past uh, and uh, uh, glorious epic past and the deeds that came uh, of those who came before. And this is also very interesting. This is the new uniform that uh, the US Army uh, reintroduced. It, it's not so new actually, because it's, it's the same World War II uniform that what they call the greatest generation once donned, when, once uh, used to fight the Nazis and uh, the Japanese empire. And it's, it's made a comeback uh, because it, it reminds the US Army and uh, US public in general of uh, an epic uh, narrative that they uh, pretty much care about still. Um, and yeah, that's loaded with tradition with their very best traditions. So, uh, and the concept of military honor and of chivalry, they're all about tradition. In the end, it's a tradition even older than, than what the greatest generation did uh, eight decades ago. Uh, it's something that goes back uh, a thousand years ago, maybe more. Uh, and well, the military tend to favor tradition and tend to favor this, these narratives that um, espouse uh, reviving our best traditions. So with that, I will close. And yeah, hopefully we can, we can um, I will stop sharing.
we can have a discussion now with Mervyn and then uh, move on to the Q&A. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Francesca. That was, uh, that was very interesting and I've read your whole paper with great, um, with great interest. Um, just a quick comment about those last two slides you showed about the military in their proud new uniforms. I spent three months at the Australian Defence Force Academy and there were any number of photographs and photo opportunities that exactly mirrored that, you know, of soldiers, men and women in their uniforms looking extremely proud and as it were commanding uh, uh, recognition as being dignified, you know, dignity was essential to them. Uh, we quite often see similar kind of demands in war studies amongst our students. Now, I just want to make a few comments and raise a couple of prob uh, questions, problems that I detected. But my first pre um, uh, advice, to, I want to come clean right at the beginning, is that I'm not an international lawyer. And for those of you who haven't read this paper, it is uh, in large measure, uh, an international law paper. And um, the conventions of lawyers are to be seen everywhere. You know, it's very detailed and very um, uh, cool, rational kind of uh, logic chopping of, 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 of the different positions. And at the heart of this paper is uh, very, are various tensions. The one is between international humanitarian law, sometimes referred to as the international law of armed conflict, and uh, international human rights law. Now, the IHL, as all of you probably know, stems all the way back to the 1860s. And it was uh, European states uh, horrified at uh, what war did to people and to them sort of agreed amongst themselves to institute some norms to restrain how wars were fought. Whereas the international uh, human rights law is much more modern and it really only got going after World War II. And we see it in all in the United Nations, for example, and there are a whole lot of legal instruments subsequent to World War II in which th these um, elements are spelled out. And there are interesting distinctions between the two for what's key for uh, international humanitarian law, the laws of armed conflict, is humanity. And uh, as it were, minimizing the damage to human humanity, whereas international human rights law, what's central there are, are human rights, of course. So um, uh, Francesco's key interest is focused on this question. Uh, which is what underlies the differences between these interpretations of international law? You know, so he wants to make it clear to us why there are the tensions between the two bodies of law. And then he's more interested indeed in tensions within international humanitarian law. So there's a, another set of tensions there. Um, and the tension there is around these two concepts, necessity on the one hand and humanity on the other. On the other, and um, Francesco is very clear about the vagueness of this notion of military necessity, because um, it's a very difficult notion. You can only specify, and this is just a logical point, one can only specify that something is necessary if you know what it's necessary for. So you have to have the goal very clearly in mind. Yet in wars and conflicts of other kinds, um, the goals are often far from clear. So just think of what we've experienced just in the fast, past couple of decades. We had the second war in Iraq, where the goals that the people pursuing the war on the side of the West, uh, including our, our Prime Minister Tony Blair, the goals shifted as the war went. So as the goals shift, necessity changes. Um, is the goal victory? Is the goal total victory? Is the goal simply to get back to the status quo ante? In other words, get the guys out and, and then uh, continue as you were. So this notion of necessity as reaching your goal is really a pretty dodgy idea. Um, and um, the notion that you must, uh, as it were, constrain necessity, which was, is already dodgy with the notion of humanity, 
that itself is highly problematic. Uh, what is the humanity constraint? It's all very well saying humanity gives you a nice, warm, cuddly feeling. I'm in favor of humanity. Well, who's not? Everybody's in favor of humanity. And so I take the, the, the punchline of this, uh, this paper, when you got through all the black letter law and you finish, you wonder where's the meat? Well, the meat is this. The meat, the meat is about um, trying to give some substance uh, to the notion of humanity. And the substance he looks for is in the notion of dignity. Um, and, and as uh, 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 he said, uh, as, as Lobo said earlier, he said the notion of dignity he, uh, falls back towards the chivalric tradition and the use of morum, honor amongst soldiers. And there's a huge tradition in Europe of that, where the, the semi-professional soldiers in the Middle Ages respected each other and did minimum damage to each other because they wanted to live and earn a salary on another day. You wanted to kill them. <laughs> you wanted to win, but you didn't want to, to lose yourself uh, or lose your life. Now, um, all of this, but this notion of introducing human dignity and then showing us that picture of soldiers who clearly think about themselves as having dignity and so on, all of this presupposes that what we're talking about are, are wars between states and conventional militaries with armies in uniforms and quite often with the notion of where the battle is taking place, a battlefield and so on. So it harks back to two world wars. But the problem with all this, and I guess this is my central uh, um, question to Francisco, is um, uh, the wars that are, the majority, there are lots of wars going on, lots, all over the place, you know, in Congo, in Somalia, in Eritrea, in Sudan, uh, in Syria, uh, ongoing in Libya, the, uh, in, in Burma. These wars are not at all like uh, the kind of wars where you get honor among soldiers. And once the soldier's given up fighting, hands up, and then the debate in this paper is about should you shoot that person or not, because there might be military necessity in shooting him, because you can't just think of each individual, you have to think of the campaign as a whole. But modern wars, for example, the so-called global war on terror, is not at all like that. On the, on the one side are the so-called terrorists who don't see themselves as terrorists. Um, and on the other side are all of us who are fighting terrorism. But this is not between soldiers who honor one another. There's very much an idea that the terrorist is beyond the pale. And so, you know, you had the president of the United States sitting in the Oval Office deciding you know, whether to wipe out bin Laden or not. No question of capturing him. You're going in there to wipe him out. You don't want any long court cases and so on. So I guess I'll, I'll just end there. There's lots more to say, but there's this big question of, aren't you simply talking about fine legal points in wars as they used to be fought? But the prospect of that kind of war appearing anytime soon is highly unlikely. Thanks very much. Francisco, before you pop in to respond to Mervyn's um, uh, really important um, and informative um, commentary, I'm going to abuse my position of chair and also just tag on to what Mervyn, um, some of his reflections too. And this is um, also uh, disclosing I am not an international law expert by any means. My curiosity around um, ethics and military values and honor comes from a position of um, a feminist curiosity and particularly looking at women, peace and security and broader important, um, you know, for the past uh, four decades, feminist research on military, military values, military culture, duty, honor, to which, you know, they argue quite persuasively that these concepts are not neutral, they're very gendered and racialized too, right? 
And so I wonder if you can reflect on, especially, you know, when you're, you're um, articulating what recommendations you have, you know, around training and, um, you know, um, and instilling um, values and honor in soldiers, right, as a way to, to, to um, um, prevent loss of dignity or whatnot when you're coming um, into conflict. Is that, um, uh, I guess the racialized and gendered aspects of this for you, you know, I mean, reflecting upon um, particularly, I imagining the militaries you're talking about and the military conventions is similar to what Mervyn was talking about, you know, co conventional armies, conventional militaries um, and their espoused ideas of duty and honor. But I, you know, I'm thinking in the 1990s, Shireen Razak, um, did a you know um, an entire book on the Canadian um, Airborne Regiment in Somalia, and the ways in which their racialized violence against locals, how they perceive to be enemies, um, uh, capturing, um, baiting, and torturing um, local Somalians, was a part of them reimagining their own dignity as soldiers and trying to find value in a mission. You know, um, and so I just wonder, and and that that's not just one case in isolation. You have more recently the Australian um, special forces in Afghanistan, the whole report on them, right? So there's like this this parallel running of you know quite abhorrent violence um, by these men and women that are supposed to be espousing these values and espousing this dignity. And I just wonder if you can reflect upon that and how your argument holds or how it might speak to that. I'll, I'll be quiet now. We do have some questions in the Q&A box, but maybe if you can just reflect on um, Mervyn and my- uh, Sure, yes. sure, yeah. excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the feedback, for the questions. Um, yeah, that's that's always the um, the big issue nowadays in, in legal scholarship. What about NIACs, non-international armed conflicts? They call them NIACs. Um, yeah, because everybody forgets about uh, NIACs. In the end, they all talk about uh, international armed conflicts or IX. And yeah, but the war on terror is actually something that's been going on for what, two decades now? And it's basically uh, NIAX or, or some, some hybrid form of NIAC and IAC if you take Afghanistan, for, for instance. Um, so yeah, what about NIACs? So uh, how to apply, uh, put differently, how to apply the principles of chivalry and, and uh, the, of military honor uh, to non-state actors? Um, well, <laughs> there is a funny, a funny uh, anecdote. There, is a, there are some drug dealers in Mexico who call themselves the Knights Templar. Okay, that, that that sounds funny, but it's probably not what we're looking for here. Okay, so um, no, uh, but um, there there is some work being done uh, right now, and yeah, for a while now uh, at the ICRC, but also by some other NGOs like Geneva Call. I also mentioned them in the article, working with uh, non non state actors who are involved in armed conflict, um, uh, and and looking at ways in, in which they could be trained in IHL in their law of armed conflict, but also in ethical principles, uh, and they actually want to um, uh, adhere to ethical and uh, well, normative framework more generally. These non state actors because it actually it's good for for PR. Uh, uh, if not out of conviction, you, you, you can, can also argue it's out of conviction. I mean, um, but uh, if, if not that, well, at least for PR reasons, it, it's good for, it's good press to say, yeah, we abide by IHL, for instance, the FARC in Colombia, we abide by IHL, therefore we are legitimate actors and we deserve a place, uh, deserve to sit on the table. Uh, uh, in, in the transitional government in Colombia, for instance, uh, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, they are interested in, in being trained in the law of armed conflict and maybe ethical principles. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there are a lot of groups actually. Uh, they're not as uniform as states, I would say, uh, uh, as legal actors. So yeah, you have the FARC in Colombia, but you also have ISIS, you have the Tamil Tigers. I mean, it, it's a very diverse collection of, of entities, but they can be legal subjects. That's also very interesting from uh, an international law perspective. States are not the only actors, the only legal subjects, not anymore, at least uh, uh, in the field of international law. You have, well, the individual, of course, uh, uh, as, as entitled to have human rights, but also uh, non-state actors like uh, belligerent groups, they, they are entitled to certain privileges and rights, and they also have obligations too. 
if they want to uh, sign a peace treaty or, uh, well, in the end, uh, participate in, in international life. So there, there is some interest, but I would say it depends on, on each group and some of them will not take it seriously like the Knights Templar in Mexico, but some of them uh, will, and some of them will be just uh, uh, not into it at all. And I would uh, put ISIS in there. I mean, ISIS would say, look, yeah, you have your notions, your Western notions of uh, chivalry and military honor, uh, good for you, but we're, we're not, uh, we're not uh, part of that world. Uh, actually, our view of the world is better. What we had a thousand years ago, we want to bring that back. Sort of like you guys with military honor and chivalry, but our version of the Middle Ages is actually much better. That's what they would say, right? So they, they wouldn't actually buy into the whole chivalry premise, I don't, I don't think. Unless you, you maybe bring Saladin to the, to the mix, but yeah, they probably won't like that either. So um, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Nyacs are a challenge definitely for, for legal scholarship, but yeah, for everyone actually nowadays. And yeah, um, moving on to, to Amanda's question. Uh, yeah, definitely um, the, the gender angle is something pretty much neglected in legal scholarship. I don't cover it in this article uh, either, but this year I, I published a blog post in e-international relations that I would refer you to uh, regarding contemporary challenges to military honor. I mentioned the Burton report about Australia and uh, I also mentioned uh, gender violence that's been going on in, in the US military for a long time and that they are finally taking a bit more seriously this year in the US after the death of a soldier in Texas uh, uh, at the hands of another soldier. So um, yeah, they're looking into that in the US right now. And I connected uh, in this blog post with the, the idea that military honor demands from soldiers uh, an enhanced uh, ethical code or, or um, the idea that they, they should be held to higher ethical standards than the rest of society. So if society is all already uh, into gender equality, I mean, at least in theory, we know that's not the case in practice, but at least in theory, then the military should do even better. That's my, my, my thesis. Um, and that, that should be uh, uh, explained and, and uh, taught to the military during training and education, of course. Um, yeah, but we, we're still uh, a long way to go when it comes to gender equality in society and within the military, uh, no doubt, no doubt about that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. Thank you for that. Thank you. I think just, you know, just to that final point, not only the US military, but the can no one talks about Canada. And this is a scandal in Canada that we have now. I think it's we're on our fourth chief of defense staff who's had to step down because of sexual violence allegations that have happened throughout their career. Right. So it's something okay. about and again, something about what feminists too particularly argue is that you have particularly amongst the officer corps, a strong espousing of values, duty, honor, that's higher than the civilian, right? Mm -hmm. And that the idea that, you know, a non-commissioned also sign on to this, running parallel with violence against women and men, right? You know, Aaron Belkin with the US military talks a lot about um, sexual violence against male soldiers and queer bodies in the US military, right? And so that is a tension that I think has always sat with particularly European or Western military. So it's something uh, something to, to, to grapple with and that military officers also grapple with, but I won't lament on that anymore. Um, Anyway, you do have a few questions and then uh, Ruben wants to ask live, but um, Brent um, Spillner um, asks, uh, it seems like uh, there's an inescapable, more personal risk to soldiers involved in a capture mission that will necessarily involve close contact with a resisting enemy compared to a kill mission that can be accomplished from a distance with um, modern weaponry. Shouldn't that risk and the commander's duty to protect the lives and well-being of his or her subordinates to the extent of their military task and permits be factored into this ethical um, calculation? So that's the first question. The second question is um, anonymous person from Australia 
who says, has this, has this topic been related to the recent case of the Breton Report? Um, the, the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force Afghanistan Inquiry Report, a report into war crimes allegations committed by Australian Defence Force during the war in Afghanistan between 2005 and 2016. So if I'll keep those questions if you want to refer to them into the Q&A, but I think yeah. what we'll do is we'll do a collection and we'll just get Ruben to ask his question and then you can respond to all of them francisco yeah yeah, yeah that's fine okay. go ahead ruben thank you very much uh francisco thank you very much for that uh for the presentation and, and thank you for that that acknowledgement that the concept of honor is not just a western construct um certainly that is uh you know what we find um in in local norms culture uh, especially religion uh, in regard to Islam and Buddhism, where the work of ICRC has been um, a lot forward leaning on that, points to the fact that that honour is a is a construct that is widely recognised um, beyond the bounds of 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 the sort of you know the Western concept of chivalry. I, I wanted to pose a question that I think there was a, a bit of a follow up and maybe an overlap. So please excuse me. And that is that that the paradox that you talk about, and I think that Colin Carl has also referred to this in terms of the annihilation restraint paradox, um, is that how are we better able uh, to prepare soldiers to operate in that paradoxical gray area between annihilation and restraint? Uh, I know work has been done in the Israeli Defense Force. Uh, about the training that has been given by soldiers and how sometimes that can lead to uh, soldiers uh, overreacting to circumstances, but also soldiers underreacting, as as they would term it, in those same circumstances. So I'm un I'd like to understand how some kind of uh, balance can be achieved from a, from a military perspective, but also from a humanitarian perspective, how we can sway that more towards restraint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ruben. Um, should I just uh, answer? Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, regarding the first first question, the risk for soldiers. Um, yeah, that's that's also uh, a very important question. Uh, lawyers throw around all these concepts, capturing, killing. Yeah, because they're they're uh, all comfortable writing about this stuff or thinking about it, and they're they're not actually on the battlefield. So <laughs> that is a problem. Um, and uh, yeah, well. Some, some authors believe that the military should be exposed to a higher risk of, uh, uh, being, of getting harmed or maybe even getting killed because it's part of their job, it's part of their profession. Um, and um, especially uh, in, in philosophy, in just war tradition philosophy, uh, revisionists uh, who are people uh, that are not comfortable with, with um, treating combatants as equals they, they they believe that just combatants should not be treated uh, equally uh, to unjust combatants so it all comes back to the justness of the fairness of the war uh, and you should actually um, um, well people who are unjust combatants or unjust civilians supporting an unjust war should be exposed to higher risk so and that means uh, maybe uh, opening the door to killing scientists, uh, but maybe also people in factories. Yeah, and that's that's a, a rabbit hole I don't want to go down into. Uh, I don't agree with revisionists. I'm more of a, a traditionalist in the just war tradition um, um, because I believe that protects people better in the end. It's, it's very, very hard to know when a war is just uh, uh, and, and when it's unjust. So yeah, um, it's it's as messy as the military necessity principle even more because military necessity has a technical component to it, but uh, just or unjust wars uh, combine uh, ideological, ethical, historical, philosophical dimensions that are just very, very hard to fathom. Um, so yeah, but I would agree. I would agree that uh, the military profession is a profession that entails a higher risk, uh, occupational hazard, let's call it that. Uh, just like with firefighters or some other professions that, yeah, when you sign up for them, you assume uh, a bigger risk to yourself. That doesn't mean that your commander uh, doesn't need to uh, care about you or because there are also legal responsibilities that could be triggered if the commanders are not, uh, do not exercise uh, their due care 
uh, in in a in a reasonable way. So, um, but they they are exposed to to higher risk. That's for sure. And yeah, in an operation to capture, uh, again, they don't call it that. I, I was told that by my, my buddy over there at Special Forces. They don't, they don't ever call it that. Uh, but if it comes to that, um, that comes with a job. That, that's something that they just assume. Um, it's different if you're recruited. That's, that's a whole different discussion, uh, again, between revisionists and, and traditionalists in the just war tradition. Well, if, if I'm a professional soldier, I, I chose the risk, right? But what if I'm recruited? What if I'm a conscript? Uh, I don't want to go to war, but my state is making me. Otherwise, I will be in jail or even worse, or they do something to my, to my family. So uh, is that acceptable risk that I should assume uh, against my will? That's a different question. That's a different question. Regarding Australia, uh, well, yeah, actually, I, I've been very uh, engaged with the Australia case. Um, I, I have written... Uh, two pieces about Australia this year. That's what happens when your life is boring, but the world's not. Uh, you tend to write stuff about what's going on outside. So in the case of Australia, um, I, I published a, a blog post on strife. You might wanna uh, look into that uh, about the Breton report and some uh, ethical and legal aspects stemming from it, speci specifically the, the potential uh, involvement of the International Criminal Court. I think that that's, uh, that's been neglected in the debate so far. Uh, and also in this piece I was telling you about uh, on e-international relations, uh, challenges to uh, military honor. I mentioned the Breton Report because in the Breton Report uh, on uh, these uh, uh, alleged war crimes committed in Afghanistan, the word honor, uh, curiously enough, is not mentioned anywhere. It's nowhere to be found. Uh, either as a value or, or as a legal principle is nowhere to be found. And I would say that what happened in Afghanistan uh, wasn't only illegal, it wasn't on, only a breach of international law, probably of Australian law, but also um, a breach of the principle of military honor. These special forces uh, um, uh, personnel, they behaved against uh, the code of military honor. Uh, and yeah, um, that reflects badly on all of uh, Australia's special uh, armed forces, of course, and all of Australia, I would say. Um, and finally, um, yeah, how, how to prepare soldiers for this gray area of operations. That's another big, big challenge uh, with hybrid wars or what, what scholars sometimes call use at VIM, which is something in between law enforcement and use at bellum. So VIM is Latin for force, so it's not Policing is not war, it's something in between policing and war, VIM. Uh, yeah, there's a whole uh, new scholarship developing uh, around that topic. Uh, and it's difficult because you, you also have on the ground uh, the tactical corporal, sometimes they call it the tactical sergeant phenomenon, uh, which means that uh, in the same uh, urban environment, in one block, you need to behave as a combatant. In, in the other block, you move on and you suddenly become a, a, a law enforcement officer or a policeman. And in the next block, you're supposed to provide humanitarian assistance, uh, give food and water to people who need it. So, and that's the, the, the tactical corporal, tactical sergeant phenomenon. And we need to train soldiers for just that. Urban warfare requires just that. And that is, that's complicated if we're uh, always referring back to the more quaint traditional principles of uh, uh, military honor and chivalry uh, that were not designed for, for that kind of scenario. So that's another challenge for military uh, education and training. That's for sure, that's for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if uh, we have more questions, but... Um... I don't think we do, but we're almost out of time anyway. So we're being very uh, efficient with our time. I mean, um, this is such a fascinating discussion, right? And I think when you bring in international law to, um, um, you know, political scientists, um, critical security studies or security studies scholars too, this is just like a, we, we see the, the challenges, the limitations and the importance as you acknowledge in your presentation um, of language, right? How we articulate and, and um, so, you know, this is a fascinating talk that when we do uh, are allowed to meet more in person, much uh, 
more often, uh, Francisco, I think, you, you know, you, me and Mirtha need to go to the pub and have a broader discussion about this. Um, Right. That's what I have to say about it. I just want to, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to to present your work here today. I look forward to reading that article. Is that a forthcoming article? Do you have? Oh, no, it's one? already published. It was published last year. Okay. So it's already out in the Military Law Review. Uh, Perfect. Um, you know, why don't you pop that to me in an email and then we can circulate that through social media, too. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Great. Can't, can't wait to read that. Um, so, yes, thank you so much for presenting your work. Uh, you know, your thank PhD. You work but your article as well and Mervyn thank you for your thoughtful and detailed engagement um, yeah. on, on the work as well too and to the you the audience for asking those really um, uh, engaging questions and and listening in this is um, that you know um, all of us together make make this um, platform this space a really engaging and important um, um, space for intellectual debate so I'm going Thanks. to be quiet now and just leave the final words to to you Francisco and Mervyn and if you have anything final to say before we close off and let everyone do whatever they need to do this afternoon. No, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you, Francesco, for your paper. And uh, yeah, and thank you to the audience for coming. That's yeah, it. same here. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Mervyn, for the time. Thank you to the audience. And yeah, looking forward to keep the discussion going. Yes. Perfect. All right. Have a great afternoon, everyone. You too. Take care. Thank you.